All right, so before we start, um, two announcements. As you know, the, the second online quiz is already available. It will be avail available for one month, uh, one month, one week. That would have been too much. Uh, there are 20 questions. I hope this time all the questions are clear because last time there were, um, uh, there were some questions which were a bit, let's say, miswritten in, in terms of language. So that was my fault. Uh, this time I've tried to make it really, really straightforward. Uh, so give it a try. Second, mo I mean, the online quiz you pretty much have to do. The online survey, on the other hand, you don't have to do. It's the second online survey. <coughs> but it's very important for us to do it. There are slightly different questions this time in the survey. Questions like, do you like more the mathematics in systems dynamics, in which case, the course has to be changed accordingly in the, ne in, the, in the coming semesters. Do you like more the business examples uh, of systems dynamics, <coughs> in which case the course has to be changed in some other ways? So that's important for us to know. <coughs> um, <coughs> so yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. Before we start with the new lecture, I'd like to finish the few slides from last lecture. Remember, we were talking about chaos in manufacturing systems. In particular, this kind of server, uh, server setup where we have a... Um, so we abstract our manufacturing system into um, buffers and a server which services these buffers. So in that example, the buffers get filled with something with liquid or with parts per, per, per time unit. This could be manufacturing lines, doesn't matter. And then they get emptied by the server. So the server's task in this example is to empty the, the buffers or to service these manufacturing lines. This is what we call the server system. The server system. The arrival system is exactly the opposite. The arrival system is uh, the buffers get um, emptied by themselves, so they have a little hole, for instance, and they get emptied at a given rate. But the server is the one supposed to, uh, to fill them. And so the task here is to have all the buffers with some amount of liquid or stuff in them at all times. Uh, we're going to look at the server system, how, how it behaves in terms of the position of the server. That's what we're interested in, to schedule the server position and to predict, more or less, the amount of liquid or the amount of utilization of each of these buffers. So this is a little bit of um, yeah, mathematics. What we have here is um, all the buffers get filled with a given rate. Uh, is there a picture about that somewhere? Yes, this one. We're looking at the switched server system. So all the buffers get filled at their own idiosyncratic rate, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on. Then they get emptied by this dot, which is the server. Well, I mean, it's kind of a two concentric circles. So they get emptied, right? And this is the inflow rate of all the buffers is simply the sum of their individual filling rates. And that, we postulate, should be equal to the outflow rate, to the, um, to the speed of, of, um, of, of how fast the, the server empties them. Right? Otherwise, uh, otherwise, the server would never be able to cope with, uh, with all the buffers. Right? If, let's say, the speed of the, buff of the server was just lambda 1, then pretty much immediately there would be filled buffers that the server couldn't be able to service because it just can't empty the buffers uh, fast enough. So what happens? This is the amount of liquid in buffer I. If that, so this is the bu buffer I, J is the position of the server. So if imagine if you have three buffers, one to three, the possible J's positions of the server would be one to three. So if the server is currently servicing this buffer I, what would that mean? That means that the buffer is being filled with this rate. 
So this is the time interval, I assume it's one. So it's lambda i times the time interval minus one, because it's being emptied at the same time. Okay? So this is how the liquid will change. The liquid in the previous time interval plus what is going in minus what is going out from the server. And accordingly, uh, if there is no server there, so the buffer is just being filled until it gets full. That's it. And I showed you these examples. <coughs> um, these are so-called Poincaré, Poincaré maps. It's uh, supposed to be French, but in other words, it's billiard maps. We saw billiard maps in the self-study, actually, on Tuesday. And one of the groups presented billiard maps. Uh, so wha wha what does that mean? I explained last time we have the three buffers. It's an example with three buffers. Uh, we start, let's say, here. Okay, Buffer 1 is relatively full. Buffer 2 is empty. If you really start in, in that 2D plane, buffer 2 would be empty. And buffer 3 is uh, just a little bit full. So what happens is, well, the server goes to buffer 1 and tries to empty it. So the buffer is empty server, emptying server one, uh, buffer one, emptying, emptying it. In the same time, buffer two gets filled and buffer three gets filled because they're not being serviced at the moment. So the buffer, uh, the server reaches this position where server two, uh, buffer two is now fuller than before, and buffer three is again slightly fuller than before, and this slope is in fact given by the rates of how the individual buffers get filled. Right? If buffer 3 gets filled much faster than buffer 2, then we wouldn't end up here, we would end up maybe here, where buffer 3 is much fuller than buffer 2. But in this case, buffer 2 gets filled much faster than buffer 3. Well, not much faster, but slightly faster. That's why we end up here. So buffer, uh, the server comes here, and accordingly, it goes back there. So it starts servicing buffer 2. We end up in a position where buffer 3 is now even fuller. Buffer 1 is also a little bit fuller. And then this whole thing would repeat like this. right? So the position of the, ser the, of the server is 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. You know, it's perfectly regular. You can always predict what the server will do. And B is the capacity of the buffers, 1 in this case. But as you decrease the capacity of the buffers, the server starts to behave more or less chaotically. So here the position is, uh, I can't tell, but it's something like this. And here it's even, it's even worse. And what, you also what, you, what you can also see is that uh, now the, um, the motion of the server is, is restricted a lot more than here. Look what the server the server can do. So basically, this triangle is much is kind of bigger than this one, right? Here, the server only goes, uh, only stays for very short time at any given buffer, and then immediately switches. So the basically the position of the, of the server is unpredictable in that case, in the long term, that is. And this, these are bifurcation diagrams. What we see here is, uh, so the three buffers just concentrate on the solid lines. So this line, this line, and that line. The x-axis is the level of the liquid in the buffer when the server went to service that buffer. So for instance, this one would mean that buffer one had was f had whatever amount of liquid equal to 0 0.1 uh, yeah, 0 0.1 when the buffer goes to, to service it. Right? So you can say as soon as the liquid gets to 0 0.1, I know that the server would go and service this buffer. Buffer 2 is 0 0.5, I think, 0 0.45 maybe, and this one is 0 0.70 something. Right? So it's perfectly predictable, but as you decrease your control parameter B, at some point, I don't know exactly what this value is, but at some point, I mean, of course, this value probably also depends on the filling rates. You see what happens. So basically, any server can be serviced at any given time. You just can't know. I mean, the liquid in the first 
and the first buffer could be here, could be here, anywhere. So that's, that's what the point is here. Yeah, and these are all the slides, actually, that I couldn't cover <coughs> last lecture. Yes, I think that's all. Now let's move on with the new one. Um <coughs> Are, are there any questions, by the way, regarding this lecture or any, any previous lectures? Yes? Uh, you said you discussed about this buffer. Is this something that can be used in, uh, let's say, information technology, like for disaster recovery? Is this actually used? Like you have real servers, computer servers, and you put the load across the two servers. Is this something that is actually used? In uh, servers or buffers? No. But the load is, I guess, distributed uh, by some algorithm. Okay. Is this, is this actually uh, I, not to my knowledge. This is not to my knowledge in disaster recovery. This, the, the rules of the server here are kind of local. So you decide what to do now at this given time step, depending on what the, uh, what the configuration is of your buffers. This sounds similar to me, actually. So maybe it could. All right. <coughs> Any other questions about anything so far? Exam? Are you interested about the exam? Maybe, but uh, I don't know any details right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the exam would probably be a lot similar to last year's exam, which, of course, is kept private, so. All right, so today's lecture is uh, a slightly different twist to our course. <coughs> yes, yeah, so I was afraid that this will happen. So far we saw a lot of mathematics, logistics map, um, this example with, this, with the manufacturing system. Uh, we saw workforce inventory and stuff like that. But we didn't actually talk a lot about economics about the economic dimension of systems dynamics. So how can we model economic systems using economic terms and, and, and things that actually have economic meaning? For instance, if you think about the logistics map, there was a control parameter R. But what does it mean? I mean, R of 3.8, it's a chaotic behavior for 3.8, but what does it mean? Anyone dare to suggest something? Oh, it doesn't mean anything unless you put it into a context. So if, and that's, that goes into the direction of how we model things. Um, you th if you can apply your, the logistics map into a situation where the mechanisms of the logistics map make sense, then you can interpret your control parameter in the way that your real system uh, behaves. For instance, biological systems, right? You can apply the logistics map uh, for biological system, the growth rate of biological systems. In fact, people, that's how it was developed. They were studying, people were studying the growth rate of bacteria. Uh, and do you know what the R would be for the bacteria? It's about four. So that's close to the chaotic regime. So if you look at a population of bacteria, the population would behave very chaotically. So when we, when we go into economics now, we, we're going to see models, but the parameters of these models, R, B, alpha, gamma, whatever, they have economic meaning. Okay, and that's, uh, that's important. So I think two lectures ago we saw the example with adoption of new technologies and new products and we talked about a little bit about uh, about supply and demand there we talked about production side which is basically supply we talked about demand side uh, or sales which is basically demand um, <coughs> I mentioned shortly 
at that lecture the role of marketing as a mechanism for bringing supply and demand together. And there we only considered very basic forms of marketing, like advertising, like common source. Uh, but this lecture we're going to talk about kind of an extension to marketing, which is markets. So markets is bringing supply and demand together. Uh, we looked a little bit at the product life cycle. Uh, that, was, that was quite easy. Um, and hopefully you still remember the bifurcations discussions from last lecture and the control parameters, stability, instability, fixed points, and uh, things like this. I had a look at, um, at a few of the people who completed the quiz, actually, very fast. There were questions about bifurcations, which to me sounded very simple, but still... Um, I got the impression that this idea was not clear enough. So I will try to repeat again what bifurcation means. Bifurcation uh, is not just having one stable solution and, and then suddenly uh, the system changes and we have two. That's, that could be a bifurcation, but it bifurcation is a lot more. It could mean destruction and creation of as many stable solution, uh, fixed points as you want. It could be one forking into five unstable ones, for instance. It could be two kind of bifurcating back into one. It could be anything. It's just destruction and creation of fixed points in very simple terms. It's not just from one we get two. And then if from one we get four, then that's like two bifurcations. All right. And as I mentioned today, we're going to look at the economics perspective. So our basic setup is the following. We have two fundamental players in our uh, system. This is, the, this is the supply side and the demand side. So basically, you can think of supply as all these firms which are producing goods, and demand is uh, all the consumers which are consuming the goods. Mm. Yeah, in macroeconomics terminology, these are called decision-making units. Because then you have to talk about how they make decisions and rationality and stuff like this. But for us, they're just like <coughs> firms and, and, and um, consumers. And now, importantly, the market is kind of the place where these two uh, decision-making units meet and exchange information, mostly exchange goods. Um, Importantly, the purpose of the market is to match supply and demand. You probably all know this. This is basic economics. And, and well, to make things easier, we're going to be talking only about competitive markets, where the decision of any single individual <coughs> cannot influence the system, the market, or in more precise terms, cannot influence the price. Obviously, you know this is not true, especially when it comes to oil, it's definitely not true, but this is what we're going to do. It, it simplifies things. There are many business deals which actually never enter a market as we know it. So this is a very big simplification here. <coughs> and now, um, how does the market ensure that supply matches demand or demand matches supply? Through the market clearing mechanism. And that's exactly what it is. It's a mechanism for changing the price in such a way that the supply matches the demand at any given time. Okay, that's also kind of a strong assumption. We know that in real life, supply almost never matches demand exactly at any given time. There's always some adjustment period. But this is, again, another assumption that we make. Um, yes, and this is this what I mentioned. So basically, in... Um, in real markets, they're never in equilibrium, despite uh, most basic economic theories about equilibrium and stuff like this. Um, so they're always trying to get into equilibrium, if you think in this way, but they never manage, at least not in the, in, in the markets um, we observe. And this is the market clearing mechanism. It's constantly trying to change the price so that supply and demand are matched. And mind you, 
market clearing mechanism is not the same as equilibrium. Right? Equilibrium is just a point where supply equals demand today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and so on and so forth. If you change that equilibrium for some reason, demand decreases, supply increases, new policies, then the market clearing mechanism would kick in and ensure that um, the price changes uh, to the new equilibrium. Okay, so if the system is at an equilibrium point, the market clearing mechanism does not, uh, does not um, work. I mean, it, it works, but it's kind of uh, idle, if you'd like, because there's nothing to do. Supply is already matched. Uh, this is um, the market allocation mechanism, where it's um, kind of a, a picture for also for, for our visual um, idea of what we're going to do in this lecture and then the coming lectures. So you probably all know this figure. We have firms which uh, supply goods to the so-called output market. This is the market of goods and services. Households buy goods and services from these output markets. So this is the upper half cycle. This is the topic of the lecture today, the output markets. In the coming lectures, we're going to be dealing with input markets as well. Input markets are uh, the markets for resources, for raw labor and for capital. So households offer offer their, uh, their, their s themselves in a way to the firms uh, as, as employees and then um, firms employ, employ uh, people, they also get land and capital to produce their, uh, their products. So these are the input markets and it's a cycle, right? This is in the coming lectures, this is today. And just for your own information, money flows in the other direction. Right? So households give money to the output market, so they pay to, their, to get their goods. The money goes to the firms, obviously. The firms pay wages and so on. So the money flows in, into the different direction. How many of you have taken any course in economics? Oh, everyone. Oh, but then I can just skip these slides. Everyone. Yes, okay. Well, really quick. We know that, I mean, this is the um, archetypical picture in, in economics. We have supply, we have demand. So for our purposes, let's think of this as aggregate supply and aggregate demand. We take the macroeconomics perspective since this is systems dynamics. We're only concerned, uh, we only study systems from kind of a bird's eye perspective. We're not interested in individual decision making. We have supply, we have demand, this is the equilibrium when supply and demand are matched exactly. For some reason if, let's say, uh, supply, or let's say for some reason if the price changes, let's say there is a minimum price suddenly by the government, we all know what happens. There is a surplus because um <coughs> Uh, basically, obviously, the suppliers would like to produce at that high price, but um, there's not enough demand for this. And the opposite thing is the shortage. Now, can you tell me what is the consumer surplus here? Who can tell me that? Yes? So he this so you mean this yeah that's true do you know why <laughs> no I mean I asked everyone but yes okay but go ahead Yes, yes, you understand, yes, you know. So basically the, <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's right, there's nothing, we shouldn't spend time on this. So basically, this 
is the price that consumers actually end up paying at the end. But look at this guy. He was willing to pay a lot of money to get his, I don't know, maybe one unit. He was willing to pay a lot of money, but now he would end up paying just this. So that difference is his surplus. What he was willing to pay minus what he actually ended, ended up paying. And the same for the, for, the cons uh, for the suppliers. Again, you know what happens when you start playing with these curves left and right. Uh, in fact, this is a real case. I think the, f the left, yes, this is uh, the market for eggs. So what happens is from the 1970 to 2002, the demand, what happened to the demand? It did what? It, it increased, right? No, it decreased. So it decreased, the supply actually increased, right? So you would expect that the price would decrease. Right, demand goes down, supply goes up. There is a lot more stuff on the market, but not so many people want uh, want it anymore. But in fact, the price. Uh, where, where is the price? So uh, da -da -da -da. this is 1970. Yes, right. So the price decreased. This is the education market. It's the same thing. So you, you can you can basically understand this graph immediately. Elasticities. Yes. Yes, more more eggs are on aggregate are being bought. And how is like because the supply increased more than the demand decreased. Okay, but the demand decreased from the lower. Hmm? But the lower the demand decreased. Yeah, so that is that is the kind of a counterintuitive thing. Um, the demand. So the, the demand decreased, meaning that for that particular price, let's look at that price. People were, were willing to buy, I don't know how many units, but then for the same price, or let's say, le let's look at the quantity. For this particular quantity, people were willing to pay whatever price. But now for this quantity, people are willing to pay less which means that more substitutes became available. So people don't want to, maybe they still want eggs, but they don't want to pay so much for them anymore. Because there are more substitutes, they become more conscious about, um, was there some kind of justification given? Okay, they, it just says that consumer preference has changed, but it may be because uh, they still want the same amount of eggs, but they want to pay less for them. It's not that they don't want the eggs anymore, right? <coughs> elasticities of supply and demand. Again, you probably know this, um, but let me just mention it. So when we talk about elasticities, at least in, in this lecture, in this course, it's about percentage changes, relative changes. Meaning, if the price changes by 2%, increases by 2%, by how many percent would your demand decrease? Right, it's always about percentage changes or relative changes. And uh, here you have the equation. So the elasticity of demand is basically given the percentage change in the quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in the price. Okay? And the same thing for the supply. Percentage change of quanti uh, quantity supply divided by the percentage change of the price. So Imagine that the elasticity of demand is 3. This number is 3. It's a dimensionless quantity. What would that mean? Well, that means that um, <coughs> if the price increases by 1%, the demand would decrease by 3%. All right? And just as a convention, okay, this is x here, but uh, it's better with numbers. So as a convention, if the demand decreases more than the price change, we call this demand elastic. So if the price increases by 1%, 
and your quantity demand decreases by 2%, so it, 2 is larger than 1, your demand decreased more than the price changed, therefore your demand is considered to be elastic. And uh, in the opposite way, it's considered to be in inelastic. Now, when we talk about percentage changes, it's important to realize that elasticity of supply and demand, they're not <coughs> constant along the whole demand line. And this is an example here. Right? If you have the following demand function, 8 minus 2p, p is the price. This is uh, elasticity of demand, by the way, ED in that notation, not EP. It's a bit confusing, but you can make a note, it's ED. Right? So you see the elasticity of that of demand for very, very low quantities and very high price is, is almost infinite. Right? So here we consider what does that mean? Well, the demand is very elastic. Here the demand is very inelastic. Do you does everybody see why? Who saw it? Oh, okay. <coughs> well, let's have a look now, shall we? Right, this is the equation. All right. The elasticity of the demand is the percentage change of that thing. So it's basically divided by that thing. All right. Or in other words, it's dq dp times p over q. dq dp, so you simply integrate this thing with respect to the price, and it's minus 2. It's the slope times p over q. Right? So you see, when the quantity demanded is 0, this gets to minus infinity. That's the point over there. If the price is zero, this thing is zero. It's the quantity here. So if quantity is four and that is two, it's two divided by four, one half minus one. You can think of this, uh, this in, in, in the following way. And actually, it's true, at least for me. If you go to a shop, right? Uh, first of all, what does that mean? This means that if the price is very low, very, very low, people really don't care. Right, the elasticity is, is very low. It, it's very in inelastic. So if the price is low and you increase a low price by 1%, your demand wouldn't change. It would more or less stay the same. And if you go to a shop and you look at some good which costs, I don't know, 40 rappen, another one which costs 80 rappen, probably it won't make any difference to you. I, I mean, if the same good, obviously. Or if you have a good which costs like 40 rappen, the next day you see the good costs 60 rappen. You wouldn't care so much. Right? This is the meaning of that thing. Uh, obviously, the opposite is true here. Right? If suddenly your favorite, I don't know, something from 20 francs jumped to f 35 francs in one day, well, you would be very sensitive to that. All right? So this is the meaning. The demand elasticity and the supply elasticity, for that matter, they're not constant along the whole price range. And in the notes, you have an example, a typical example of what is perfect elasticity and whatnot. So let's look at the... Huh. I just noticed that something is wrong with the, with, the with the resolution, and I'll get angry emails again, but okay, well, never mind. Uh, we're going to look at um, a very popular example of, of this supply and demand in the market. So remember, we had a supply, we had a demand, they're governed by some equations, and the price, they're basically matched together by the price or the market clearing mechanism. Um, and people have tried to model this situation. The model is called the cobweb dynamics. Have you ever heard of this terminology, cobweb? Okay, no. 
That's good. Um, <coughs> this is the well. This is the setup. We have a um, supply demand. They're linearly dependent on the price, as we all know. This doesn't have to be the case, by the way, but uh, in our purpose, it's true. They're linearly dependent, and this is the linear dependency. D assumption here is that demand adjusts immediately to the price. So if I go to the shop and I see that something has suddenly doubled its price, I can immediately adjust my demand. But suppliers can't really do that. Right? So you need some technological time. You need some time to produce your units, your, your, uh, your production. So you can't adjust your supply immediately. And the popular example is with uh, pigs. Right? So you need some time to breed the pigs. So if the price increases suddenly, you want to produce more, obviously, but you can't really produce more today. You have to wait maybe a year to do this. And in our um, model, supply uh, lags behind uh, the, the, the price by one time unit. Right? So the supply here is determined by the price in the previous time period. Or if you want to think about it, the price here affects the supply after one time period because people need time to adjust. But demand obviously adjusts immediately. And these are the familiar shapes. This is an increasing function. And this is a decreasing function. All right. Here the parameters alpha and gamma are the basic supply and demands at price zero. They're kind of idealized versions, of course. If the price is zero, we probably won't have a market. But um, in uh, here, we basically assume that this is kind of a demand, basic demand and supply, which are always there, like demand and supply for air, if you'd like. The beta and delta are the so-called price derivatives of supply and demand. These are the slopes of the curves, right? If you differentiate this with respect to, <coughs> to the price, you get beta and you get minus delta. So these are simply the slopes. These are not elasticities, right? These are absolute, if you want to think about elasticities, this would be absolute elasticities. So if you change the price by one monetary unit, the demand would change by, by uh, delta quantity units. But we're talking about percentages here. For us, elasticities are percentages. Therefore, the demand elasticities are given by this. Right? We need the price and the demand, and the same thing for the supply. It's, you can calculate this in the same way that I showed you. Right? So it's basically ds dp times p over, p over s. Yes. <coughs> yeah, that, that's, th that's the thing. The price derivative times the price minus, minus S. <coughs> and we want to see what happens when we start playing with, with our control parameters. Now, which are our control parameters? Any ideas? We talked a lot about control parameters. I tried to give you kind of an intuition which are good candidates for control parameters. Yes? Um, yes, that's true. That's true, yes. So, in other words, we're going to be using, we're going to be playing with the price derivatives. <coughs> or oh, as you mentioned, with the elasticities. Right, because this is something we can easily change. Not easily, but uh, it's something we can change. We can change how people, how elastic, let's say, people are to a given product by, let's say, promoting substitute products, for instance. But we can't really easily change the basic supply and demand because the assumption is that these are, you know, they're, they're basic, they're, uh, they're fundamental. It's difficult to change them. So. Uh, before we actually put this into the computer, it happens, uh, it turns out that this is a very easy model to analyze. It's a very easy one. Um, <coughs> you can solve it analytically. In the notes, so not in my notes, but in your notes, I've included 
um, the way to solve it. Um, but yeah, so before that, let's look at this. We want the market clearing mechanism to work, meaning the supply matches demand at any given point of time. Okay, so supply matches demand. There you go, supply matches demand. We make these two things equal, and we can express the price in time t in terms of the price in the previous time period. <coughs> there you go. That's exactly how we got this recurrence equation. This is called the recurrence equation because the price re reappears on the right-hand side. All right. <coughs> you can actually solve this exactly. And in the notes, uh, you have the procedure how to solve it exactly. And also the solution is given there. Um, can I get your handout really quick? Not a handout. Right, so if you look in your notes, I mean, you can probably look at his, yes. Thank you. If you look in your notes, then you can see the solution for the price in time t. Right, it's, it's given by this quantity. Right, so let's, let's think about it. Before, I'm show, before I show you how the dynamics develops, we can actually think about it and, and understand everything about this model. So tell me, just looking at the price, at the solution for the price in the notes, what are the possible outcomes of this model? Depending, of course, on our control parameters beta and, and delta. Don't care about all anything else, just these two parameters. What are possible outcomes? Just look at the solution. Yes. Oh, you, you're not... No, okay, fine. It's easy. So what will happen in the long term when, when uh, the time goes to infinity? Let's say you wait for one million time steps. Just look at the equation. What will happen? You have a minus beta over delta to the power of t. This is the quantity that we should focus on. All right, so uh, you have the whole break to think about this. <laughs> All right, thanks. I'm going to change my, uh, my presenter so that things are a bit more visible. Well, are they? Oh, no, I have to change the... something else too. Uh, let's see if that's going to work. Should work. Yeah. <coughs> So why is that thing not... Oh, it's off. Hmm. So somebody mentioned an important thing which I couldn't change in the slides, unfortunately. Now, I tried to do it, but there was not enough time. It's this thing here. Let's see. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. How was it? This? Not this? Yes. So... Um, if the price increases by 1%, right, demand will drop by, so X percent could be a bit confusing. The right thing is demand will drop by ED times 1%, right? So ED times 1% because, I mean, that's ED is right here. It's given here, right? That's just a small thing. But let's go back to the important question. What happens to these dynamics and... Can I again use this handout? So you had a 15-minute time to look into this. What will happen if, look at it, beta over delta is larger than 1? 
Just look at it. Yes. Yes. You will have... No, no, it's... No, no, that's not right. Just look at it. So let's, let's assume it's minus 2. All right? Beta over delta is 2. So minus beta over delta is minus 2. Let's see what happens with when we take the powers of minus 2. So minus 2 to the power of 1 is minus 2. So if minus 2, 4. Minus 8, 16. Minus 32, 64. Minus 128, 256. So you have exploding oscillations with increasing amplitude. So basically going from minus infinity to plus infinity. These are exploding oscillations. If beta over delta is smaller than 1, you have the opposite. You have damping, damped oscillations. So you have oscillations which actually decrease and eventually stabilize to a certain value. And what will happen if beta over delta is 1? Now look at it. That's the kind of math that you have to know for the exam, so think a bit. No? Hmm? I, I again didn't hear. Exactly. Right? You have 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. So the sign just changes and you have two values. Like it's they're constant oscillations. And you, what you can also see from this thing is that let's say beta over delta is smaller than 1. The minus beta over delta to the power of t goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. And the only thing left in the long term is this gamma minus alpha divided by delta plus beta. It's exactly, uh, is it it's exactly this value. All right? It's exactly this value that is left. So this is the stationary state. Whether it's stable or not is a different thing entirely, right? Fixed point, stationary state, equilibrium, they all mean the same, but they don't imply anything about stability. Here, how we have found this, this uh, stationary point for the price is uh, not by solving the equation, by a much simpler way, and that is um, we know that <coughs> thanks, I'm not going to need that. We know that at equilibrium, supply equals demand. So that thing here, supply equals demand. Um, and by equalizing supply and demand, so basically, no, sorry, at equilibrium, the price today equals the price tomorrow, the price the day after tomorrow, and so on and so forth. So just by the same procedure that I showed you last time, we take the price today equals the price tomorrow, pt equals pt minus 1, but the price today also equals this thing, the right-hand side. So if we equate these two equations, you get immediately the stationary value for the price. But by solving it analytically, we can talk about stability a little bit. And you saw that the stability changes to exploding oscillations or damping oscillations when we change this ratio beta over delta, uh, right? Yes. And this is uh, what happens when you put it into a computer. And the self-study for today is creating a Vensim model for the cobweb dynamics. And probably this is the only self-study where there is a sample solution. And that is the sample solution, these pictures, exactly. So what do we see? <coughs> it's exactly what we just discussed. If beta over delta is smaller than 1, we have damped oscillations. Right? So the damped oscillations. Uh, the blue curve... The blue curve and the green curve are supply and demand respectively. And what you can notice on the figure is that supply equals demand at any given time step. This was the market clearing mechanism. Supply equals demand at any given time step. And you see how the price develops. The stationary value of the price was given by, 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 this, by this quantity here. All right. <coughs> And, oh, sorry, 
why this why is this called a cobweb? Because if you plot a graph like the one on the right, so quantity is on the x-axis, price is on the y-axis. It's similar to the uh, logistics map, actually, how we plotted the development of the logistics map. Um, so let's start from here. <coughs> the explanation is also given in the notes. Uh, we have, let's say, a given quantity that is desired by the population, let's say 300. And according to... Um, According to the demand curve, the price for 300 units should be whatever, I don't know, 60 for instance. But this price is too low for, for suppliers, so they don't want to produce it. In the next time step, the quantity, um, right, so the, supply, uh, the, the suppliers would only produce, I don't know, 130 units. Is it? No, 135. So for this price, only 135, 135 will be produced. <laughs> In the next time period, the people see that there are 135 units on the market. So their demand immediately shifts here, and the new price would be set to 250, I think. Yes, 250. Right, so the demand immediately adapts to the price. People saw the price is 60. Uh, sorry, people saw the quantity is 135. Their demand changed immediately. As a result, the price changed to 250. The suppliers would only see the 250 in the next time period. So in the next time period, the suppliers see 250, and they would produce that value here. And then it goes on and on and on. And if it's stable, eventually we reach an equilibrium. And it looks like a cobweb because that looks like a spider net. That's why it's called a cobweb. It looks like a very kind of strange spider web, but I guess you can, it's not stranger than the constellations that you see in the sky. So, yeah. Um, yes, so this is. Instability, if the bit over delta is bigger than 1, then we get exploding oscillations. And obviously, uh, in the cobweb, we start with somewhere here, close to the equilibrium, and then we would diverge outside eventually here. It will never reach a stable point. And this is what happens when it's equal to 1. Right, constant oscillations, the same two values repeat over and over again for the price and for the supply and demand. This was the simple cobweb. It's a very simple model. It's very easy to implement in Vensim. Um, and you saw that there is not, no, ca no chaos here. The, the equations were very simple, linear equations. There was a lag in supply by one term, uh, by one time period. And before I continue, could you tell me how much time is left? I want to set the timer. 35 minutes, all right. <coughs> um, and we saw that the only, you can even collapse the two control parameters to one by taking the ratio, beta over delta, right? So in that sense, only one control parameter controls stability and instability, but there is no chaos here. That's an important thing to remember. Um, and probably you already you can already identify a lot of uh, problems with this simple model. Some of the problems are mentioned here. Um, we have linear supply and demand. That may not be such a strong assumption, um, but mm, the the next more stronger assumption is the way suppliers form expectations, right? In our model, suppliers were very kind of uh, non-intelligent. They were reacting with a lag of one um, to whatever happens, but they were not making any kind of predictions or anticipations. They were just reacting. And the only thing which introduced the lag was simply the fact that they needed time to ramp up their production to produce more or to produce less. <coughs> uh, 
the results nevertheless kind of apply for markets which exhibit cyclical behavior. So if you have a market with cyclical behavior, you can try to apply this simple model. And based on, um, on the control parameter, the, this ratio, you can probably try to create policies for these cyclical markets and try to see if, if the results of, of these policies match your expectations. But the bigger problems are basically the fact that it's a very simple dynamics. We only have damped oscillations, exploding oscillations, or regular oscillations. We don't have kind of a random looking prices. As you all know, prices kind of look random. We don't have chaos. And we have a lot of markets, which most of the markets, I would say, uh, which have a much more complicated dynamics than that. We only have one market. That's another thing. Especially today, this assumption is very, very strong and probably unreasonable. Because today, I mean nowadays, not today in particular, we have markets which influence each other all the time. Lots of markets coupled together in some, somehow. You know, the gold market is somehow coupled to the foreign exchange market. They all influence each other somehow, but this is not captured here. <coughs> And in fact, I mean, all these assumptions can be relaxed. You can uh, uh, improve the model by introducing more complex supplier expectations. So suppliers anticipate something. They don't react so kind of, you know, this kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Here we're going to improve only the fact that there is no coupling between different markets. That's important. So we have... Um, we're going to couple, basically, two cobweb dynamics. And that's why uh, we refer to this as coupled cobweb dynamics. So we have really two cobwebs, cobweb models, and we just couple them together. Without introducing new variables, without introducing um, different, linear f di different functions for supply and demand. So this is the setup. We have end producers. Uh, or N suppliers, and we have two markets, X and Z. Um, at each point of time, certain fraction of the producers N decide to either go to the X market or to the Z market. And in our example, we have W X is the fraction of W X T is the fraction of producers which decide to go to market X at time T, and obviously one minus that is the fraction of producers who want to go to, uh, to market Z at time T. And again, you can all kind of see the implicit assumption is that suppliers basically have only two choices, go to X or go to Z, but you have to produce. You can't just leave the game completely. Each supplier individually produces X, uh, quantity SX at time T. So SX would be the amount of stuff that each supplier in market X produces and correspondingly to market Z. So each supplier produces the same amount, S. And of course the total supply would be given by that ratio, N times W times S. Right? So N times W is the amount of suppliers in market X times the amount that each supplier produces, so you get the total supply. Market clearing. Demand equals supply, right? This is the same thing as before. The question is, what is the price? We're interested in the price, remember. We do the same thing as before, the same analysis as before. The demand and the supply in market X and Z are still the same, linear functions, increasing or decreasing. Increasing or decreasing for demand and supply, they're given there. And we have, um <coughs> in the same way as the single cobweb dynamic, we can get these recursive equations for the price in market X at time T, it's the same as before, or for the price in market Z at time T. So now tell me, I mentioned that you know these are going to be coupled cobweb dynamics. So are these two equations coupled the way you see them now? Mm. 
No. Yes. Yes. Are you yes or no? No, the answer is yes. This is what couples the two equations. All right? It's a W. Nothing else. I mean, all these parameters A, B, D, and Z, and so on, uh, they're kind of individual parameters for the markets. But W is what couples them. Come again? They're not the same, that's true. No, they are. If you, <laughs> the sum of these two, W, X, and W, Z, is one. Right? So if you set this to whatever value, I don't know, 0 0.4, you immediately determine the other one. Right? So that's, that's what couples them together. Uh, if you want to decouple them still, you can do this. And this is done in, uh, in that slide. It serves as a control case, kind of, to see what happens if the markets are decoupled. And we can easily decouple them by assuming that W is kind of constant. So in that example, half of the suppliers go to market X and half of the suppliers go to market Z, 0 0.5 in that case. In which case, yes, the markets will be decoupled be because at any given point of time, W in both markets would be 0 0.5. It's like a constant. Markets are perfectly decoupled. Um, in the exactly same procedure as for the single cobweb dynamics, we can get the recurrence equation for the price. You saw it. I mean, these are the recurrence equations. And we can solve them in the same way that was shown in the notes <coughs> for single cobweb dynamics. Right, and I think in, in the notes for this for this slide, you have the solution for the price and market X. Is is that true? You have it, right? Yes. The final solution. So in the same way as I showed in the previous notes on slide ten, I believe you can find the the price. How the price in market X at any given point of time, develops. And obviously it's the same for market Z, because they're decoupled. If you look at this solution there, you can see that the stationary state is given by that, by that quantity. And again, if you look at the, uh, at the solution, you can see that the equivalent of that minus beta over delta to the power of t is now this. Right? It's now this. <coughs> so this is now minus beta over delta, and we want the absolute value of this to be obviously sl uh, smaller than 1, just as before, in order for us to get um, stability of this equilibrium. Um, if you decide to normalize n times w to 1, which you can do, it's simply a matter of normalization, then you're left with b over d, which is the exact equivalent of beta over delta that we had before on slide 10, I believe. So it's the same dynamics as before. No surprise, markets are decoupled. We shouldn't expect anything more. <coughs> and the behavior would be the same. Damped oscillations, exploding oscillations, so on. But let's see what happens if we couple them. <coughs> the coupling is in terms of this W. Um <coughs> So basically the answer we, we uh, the, the question we need to answer is how do suppliers choose one market over another you can probably come up with a lot of a uh, lot of um <coughs> reasons why would one supplier choose x or z but we can probably all agree that a good kind of first step is to look at the profits right so suppliers would like to go into markets with higher profits so they would like to, they wouldn't like to be in commodity markets. They would like to be in some kind of high-end 
consumer electronics, for instance. Not everybody can do it, though, but that's a different question. <coughs> so, um, when you talk about this kind of decisions, a very popular function, in a sense, to model this kind of decision is the so-called logistics function. You, can you will probably encounter this function a lot in other courses, especially the economics courses. Um, and what it tells you is, uh, let me see how I can explain it. So it gives you the whole spectrum of, of kind of short-sightedness, if you'd like. So on one end of the spectrum, if you make a decision, on one end of the spectrum, you have the myopic response. Myopic means short term. Right? So you only look at the short term, what happens tomorrow, and you make a decision. On the other hand, you have the long term. So you look at, you try to incorporate a lot of data from the past history uh, in before you make a decision. And this function models this, this balance between short and long term sightedness in a sense. So let's let's look at it. <coughs> F is this parameter which controls where you are in this spectrum. S right? F is the so called sensitivity. How fast suppliers change markets. Right? Um, so let's look at, at an example. If F is zero, F is zero meaning um, suppliers, so if that is zero, the whole function is just one half. So we have the decoupled markets again. But that means that no matter what the profits are, no matter what the profits are, suppliers don't care. They would always be have a probability of one half to go to X or Z. So in that sense, they don't consider any information about the profits, and this is this is what what it says here. There is no response to market information. You don't care at all. In that sense, there is no sensitivity. The the um, suppliers are not sensitive at all. In the other extreme, when F is infinite, so the sensitivity is infinite. This is the myopic best response. You only look in the I mean even the smallest change in the profits in one of the markets would immediately cause everybody to go there. And let's take an example. Imagine <coughs> F is infinitely big, but the profits in both markets are zero. Right? So this would still be one half, assuming that producers would like to produce in markets where the profits are zero. In fact, that's not such a strong assumption because, as you know, in perfect competitive markets, the profits are zero. Um, so Profits are zero, one half probability. Now, imagine the profit in market X increases by just a little bit, by, by the smallest unit of monetary value that you can imagine. What happens then, since this is infinite, that immediately becomes infinitely big. That becomes infinitely big. This is still zero. Uh, this is still one. So that is infinitely big. That is infinitely big. That is 1, so in that sense this doesn't matter, but this ratio would be 1. So immediately the probability that you go to X, to the market X, is 1. So everybody would go there. They're very sensitive. The same thing for Z. Right? If Z becomes, if the profits in market Z become just a little bit positive, this is 1, this is 1, but this is infinity now. And the whole thing would be zero, so nobody would go to market X anymore. Right? WX, this is WX. <coughs> All right? And this is the logistics function. Um, <coughs> yes? Here? This one. Ah, uh, this one. Yes. Oh. Yes, you're right. Uh, no. Um, oh, yes, 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 yes. So it depends on the profits. 
If, if, if the profits in market X become slightly bigger, then WX would be one. If the profits in market Z become slightly bigger, then X would be zero. Right? But, I mean, this is the idea behind this, this function, and it's used a lot. Right? When f is infinite, you have this myopic best response. When f is not infinite, it's possible to have suboptimal decisions. Suboptimal meaning you don't go to the market with higher profits. In the extreme, when, when f is zero, you make wrong choices half of the time. Right? Because the probability is one half. Okay. <coughs> Let's look at the profits now. Um, the profits, so O here, the subscript O is used to s identify both X and Z markets, right? So if you want X, just put X. If you want Z, just put Z. O is like combining them. So the profits are obviously the revenue minus the cost. The revenue is given by obviously the, the price times the amount of stuff that you sell. And the costs obviously are a function of of how much you have produced. In our example, we suppose that the costs are quadratic or nonlinear. Nonlinear would be a, a better, better term. The fact that they're quadratic is just one example of, of nonlinearity. <coughs> so, and okay, we look at, I mean, these are the costs, and we, we can express the profits in, in, in this way. These are the profits now in the two markets. Question, are they coupled, the profits in the two markets? What do you think? Come again? Yes, so these are the profits in the two markets. In market, uh, this is Z. Market Z and market X, revenue minus cost. Revenue minus cost. You know, it's nothing, nothing complicated. So are they coupled, the two profits in the two markets? Before we had the price, but now we have the profits. What do you think? No? Yes? It's either yes or no. <laughs> I mean. Let's say they're independent. They're individual. The coefficients, yes. They're individual. These are the kind of questions that you should get right all the time because they would probably be on the exam. Exactly. I mean, the prices are coupled. We know that the prices are coupled through the W. The W is this one. Look, the W is this one. Yeah. The prices are coupled, uh, the profits are coupled, which means that the profits in market X influence somehow the profits in market Z and vice versa. And how exactly they influence each other obviously depends on the parameters. Uh, but <coughs> yes. Right, so let's see what happens now when we put this into the computer. And by the way, the coupled cobweb dynamics would be also a self-study. But not today, probably next week. So today is just the cobweb the normal cobweb, when you get a hold of it, uh, or hang of it, how, th how to do it, then you simply make, I mean, copy-paste, you take the two cobwebs and you couple them with a W. So it's, um, it would be kind of a um, easy self-study given the fact that you've done the cobwebs. W so here we choose, I mean, all these parameters, a, B, C, and D, and, and 
for now we assume that we have symmetric markets. Symmetric meaning that the sensitivity, uh, the supply and demand sens uh, elasticities, and the um, <coughs> basic supply, basic demand, they're all equal for both markets. They're perfectly symmetric. In a sense, consumers and suppliers in both markets are the same. And we have chosen these parameters, A is 20, B is 6, C is 2, and so on. doesn't matter. The sensitivity, though, is important, 0 0.17. Right? So it's not infinitely big. You're not incredibly sensitive. I mean, that also is doesn't make sense to be incredibly sensitive. Right? You wouldn't like to switch uh, in the latest change, because probably you have switching costs. So if the profits just increased by one rappen, you probably wouldn't switch. Anyway, and this is what we observe. So on here we have on the left side, left column is the price in market X, and immediately to next to it is the price in market Z. And you can see that um, one relationship you can immediately uncover is when the price is high in market X, it's correspondingly low in market Z. I mean, you would expect that, right? If the price is high in market X, that means that <coughs> uh, in the next time period, more suppliers would go there because the profits would be higher for high price. But when more suppliers go there, uh, the price would go down because you know, we would have more supply, and we ha when we have more supply, the price goes down. So in the next time period, the price would go down. And this is exactly what you see. You see an oscillation between high-low price, high-low, high-low, for each single market. But obviously, if the price is high in market X, that means that there are not enough supply in market X. Most of the supplies are in market Z, where the price is low. Right? So they're kind of negatively correlated. It's something that, that is no surprise. It makes sense. The profits are correspondingly coupled in the same way. So when the profits are high in one market, they're low in the other market. It's kind of trivial. And uh, the bottom most picture, the weights, or this W. And I believe, yeah, this is WX. So this is the fraction of people which are a fraction of suppliers producing in market X. And in market Z would be 1 minus that. So you see it kind of fluctuates. We wouldn't call this chaos, would we? I mean, it, it's not perfectly periodic, but it's somehow, we call it quasi-periodic motion. So it's almost periodic. I mean, if you see, like, we have, for the price, you know, we have this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. I mean, they, they kind of look the same. And in between, this kind of little jumps, they're kind of similar. So that's not perfectly periodic, for sure. But it's not chaos. And this is what we get for <coughs> uh, the dependency on the sensitivity parameter f. This is one of the most, actually, important parameters, f, the sensitivity. So what we have, th uh, I mean, these are phase space, phase space plots, the ones I showed in the self-study. So on the leftmost, uh, the top left corner, we have the price in market X versus the price in market Z. And as I just told you, they're negatively correlated, right? Very nicely negatively correlated, very clear negative correlation, right? When the market goes low, uh, high in, ma in, market in, in market X, when the price goes uh, high in market X, it goes low in, in market Z, and vice versa. So basically, this dynamics would go like this, like this. Up, down, up, down, up, down, and so on. This is for sensitivity 0 0.17, whatever this means, some sensitivity. But now, what happens when you increase the sensitivity by a little bit? And that means suppliers now become more sensitive to profit changes they would choose with higher probability the markets the market with higher profits and what what happens is given on the top right um, plot this is again price x versus price z they are still negatively correlated but not in phase anymore 
not in perfect phase. Right? So there would be some delay. I mean, this is why now we have kind of an oval. It's similar to, I think, one of the self-studies that we looked at. There we had, I think, the population dynamics, I think, rabbits and foxes. Right? So there's two negatively correlated. I mean, you can see if the price and market X increases, so we go along this line, the price and market Y, uh, sorry, this is the supply. Um, yeah, but okay, never mind. So if the price in market X increases, the supply um, in in market X would also increase. Oh no, sorry, what is that? Yes, oh, here, here. We have to be looking at this plot. Sorry. So this is the price again, the two prices. They're still negatively correlated in phase, but what is different now from the top row? Yes, the sensitivity is higher for sure. I mean, that's kind of the a priori uh, assumption. We we chose a higher sensitivity for the suppliers. But how would you interpret the difference between the leftmost <coughs> plot and uh, uh, the other one? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So the amplitude of fluctuations, so this amplitude here, is higher. Right? So, I mean, here you see the price fluctuates between, uh, what is that? I would say hmm, 10 maybe to, I don't know, 17. But here it's from 8 to 17 or even 18. Right, so there's a much larger fluctuation. What is shown here is the price versus the supply in the same market, market X. Um, and now these are again negatively correlated. I mean, of course, when the price goes up, so here, so the price goes up. Um, the supply goes down i believe this should be sup supply and market z mm, yes otherwise it doesn't make sense right so if the price goes up <coughs> in in market x um the supply in market Z should go down because now more people come to market X because the price is larger there. Yeah, so I will fix that in the notes, uh, in the handout. It should be supply in, in, in market Z. And again, if you increase the sensitivity, what we change is simply the amplitude of these fluctuations. There's still no chaos here. They behave just as we would expect, just as uh, in the previous slide here, right? The price goes up in one market, profits go up in that market, correspondingly the profits go down in the other market. And then the whole thing changes again in the next time period. <coughs> but again, I mean, not again, but the interesting thing is that we can get chaos. And uh, in the next two slides, I believe, yes, the next two slides, we have a lot of bifurcation diagrams depending on these parameters, uh, all the parameters actually. So let's look at parameter F, the bottom left, uh, the <coughs> bottom right plot. This is the parameter F, the sensitivity of the, of the suppliers and the price in market X. So as long as the sensitivity is below is some value, 0 0.25, I believe, the price is more or less stable. OK? But as soon as the sensitivity, this is the price in, in market X, but as soon as the sens sensitivity increases past this uh, bifurcation point, then the price becomes really chaotic. 
It starts to behave really I in a chaotic way. And then you can see the typical stuff that you expect. Chaos, window in the chaos. So here we have a period, a periodic oscillation with period 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I would guess. Right? Then again chaos, then again windows in the chaos. It's a much richer um, behavior than the logistics map. Okay? The parameter B, what was the parameter B? Parameter B was the price derivative. In fact, 1 over B was the price derivative. But that's the slope. If you think about it, it's the slope. Or 1 over B is the slope of, of the demand curve. <coughs> Again, past some value of B, the price becomes chaotic. And if you look at this kind of funnel shape, right, it goes like this. You can also think that when we increase B, the chaos increases in the sense that now the price can fluctuate not because these two values randomly, but between these two values randomly. So the range of fluctuations is much higher. Right, like this. And the same thing for the parameter D, but the opposite thing. Parameter D was um <coughs> now the or one over D was the slope of the supply curve. Well, uh, s for you, supply would be yeah, the slope of this curve. One over D. So when we decrease it, actually, so decreasing the slope means that it becomes more like that. That's when we get chaos now. And remember, these are symmetric markets, so the parameter D would be the same in both markets. And we get the chaos, the same for the parameter C. Parameter C was the supply, which is always there, even if we have zero price. These are symmetric markets, but obviously the markets are not symmetric. We can choose different values for these parameters A, B, C, and D. And in that example, we've chosen D uh, to be 8 in market X and 6 in market Z. Again, what we see are bifurcations, but now, and that's the, the thing that I'd like to close with, now we have the parameter B in market Z influencing mar the price in market X, right? So the parameter B, remember, was the price deriv derivative of the demand, or 1 over B. So that's the slope of the demand curve. If we increase the slope of the demand curve, suddenly we get chaotic behavior of the price and market X. Right? So we changed the basic structure of one of the markets, so we kind of increased uh, the demand slope by whatever policy we'd like, and we created chaotic behavior in the price in market X. The same thing for the supply, the, the price derivative of the supply. When we decrease it in market Z, Again, we get chaotic behavior in market uh, in the price in market X. So, what? Why is this important? And this is the last slide. Well, um <coughs> first of all, these are endogenously generated fluctuations. They are generated by the structure of our system. They are not uh, kind of imposed from above. Somebody introducing chaos into the markets. They're just generated by the coupling of the two markets and the non-linearity non in, uh, in that this coupling introduces. And um <coughs> now you can think about policies. So if you change something in one market, for example, you change, you introduce whatever, uh, let's say, minimum, uh, minimum price or like uh, price ceilings or whatever. You change this, you play with the demand and supply curve somehow. You change their slopes, for instance. In one market, this would have unexpected, unforeseen consequences, could have unforeseen consequences into the coupled market. Right? So if you have, if you're in this regime here, and you observe stable behavior of the price and market Z, but chaotic behavior in, in the price and market X, one policy would be, well, let's try to decrease the slope of the demand curve. That would help. Uh, if, if you believe that the coupled cobweb describes 
your market, of course. So this was today's lecture. Uh, the self-study is about the cobweb dynamics. It's very easy. Oh, yes, is the, uh, the cobweb dynamic. Where is it? Here. Yes, that's all. See you on Tuesday. Thank you. <coughs>